G'day guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be showing you how I forge a Muso buoy out of this piece of 10 by 50 or 1 8 by 2 inch piece of W2. This is actually my first time giving a run on the 4 pound uh, mountain hammer. It's an English cutler's hammer that I forged and engraved uh, for myself for doing bigger projects like this and I had a great fun time making it and using it. Now obviously first thing I'm going to do is knock those corners in and start working down a tip. It's fairly thick stock and it's obviously fairly hard to move given that W2 is such a high uh, carbon steel but a uh, couple heats and we'll have this forged out. You just want to keep pushing those corners in at a nice 45 degree or a little bit shallower than that angle making sure you have nice even heavy blows switching back and forth and then once you've got your rough point established you can start really pushing it back a little bit and uh, drawing out that point and at this stage we're not establishing the length of the final point because we're still staying at bar thickness and this is a really important uh, point is to stay at bar thickness when you're doing your first profiling uh, and that'll assist with your preform because if you first do your distal taper which we will be putting in later uh, you'll end up having cupping issues where the uh, material will cup around itself and not actually forge. You want that thickness to be able to push this down. Now, you don't have to start with 10 millimeter stock. You could start with quarter inch or six millimeter stock. Uh, I wouldn't go any thinner than that for a buoy of this size, but uh, yeah, quarter inch um, or, or you know eight mil, a little bit larger than quarter inch. Uh, or 10 mil is what I prefer. And the thing is, is that even though you're starting with 10 millimeter stock, that doesn't necessarily mean that your final thickness of the Ricasso is going to be 10 millimeters. Um, most of the time I'm going to be end up grinding off about a millimeter each side, which means that even at, at 10 millimeters, I'm going to end up with a eight millimeter thick blade in the end. Now, this is a little bit of a longer video. That's purely because it's a little bit of a longer forging session. Um, it is quite a heavy piece of metal to move. And uh, I'm just really glad that I had the hammer with me. You could take your time, do this a lot slower. Or what I would advise is actually cutting your point in first. So cut a 45 degree angle. Uh, it's going to make forging a lot faster. I just decided to show that I could do large stock like this relatively easy. And it was a good way for me to try out the new hammer and uh, I really put it through its paces. You'll notice that I'm always dressing the thickness. I don't want it to mushroom out too much because that A can cause cold shuts and B it deforms back the point a little and widens it out again as we dress the thickness down and if you allow it to push down too far in one direction you're going to be chasing it back and forth way more in the end so uh, always make sure to hit on the flats and come at it from both sides don't just flip to one direction all the time when you're dressing your uh, mushrooming try and dress it from both sides at one point or another uh, and actually here I just recognized that I was going a little bit out of square with my hammer blows so I just turned it up on the 45 a little bit to knock those corners in uh, to try and square it up again because having square shoulders and, and square stock is very important even when doing tapers. Now to refine the point, I'm just taking it to the very corner of the anvil and brushing that hammer down a little bit, trying to get it to pinch that material between the anvil and the hammer. What I'm trying not to do is actually hit the anvil with my hammer, and uh, I'm trying not to pinch a big beak of material over the edge of the anvil either. Uh, I just want to get it down to a nice fine point, and we can refine that later in the, in the process, but having a nice fine point at this stage helps. And once I've got it fine enough, I'm going to push it all down to one side because this is a single edge blade. Uh, the edge is obviously going to be where we're pushing the point towards rather than away from. 
Um, and as I have discussed in previous How to Forge videos, if you watch the playlist, um, you can decide your tip shape based on the slope of your final forging. In this case, I'm looking for a slightly shorter clip than I will eventually get because I'm going to be drawing out distal taper and as I draw out distal taper that taper is going to get longer. So I'm going to go for a short flat taper and that means that as I forge the bevels it's going to become a curved clip uh, instead of a flat clip or a, or a convex clip. Uh, and that's by choice, that's just purely because I'm trying to mimic the original Muso buoy, which had a curved clip. And I'm just going to spend a couple of heats refining that and making sure it's all flat before I start drawing out the distal taper. And I will come back to refine that uh, after I draw distal taper because there is a little bit of distension from the forging process as well. And now that I have the tip shape that I want, I'm going to move to my straight peen, which was made for me by Hans at Charming Hollow Forge. Uh, you should go over and check his channel out. I'll link it down in the description. Um, and I'm just going to start drawing out that material. Light blows at the base and then heavier blows out towards the tip to try and increase the taper of the material distally. Uh, and I'm only about halfway down the blade. I don't want to try and do a full length distal taper from ricasso to tip in this case because the blade is so long and so thick at the ricasso there's too much of a chance of me causing some form of deformation around the areas that don't need forging later. So I'm only going to taper half of the blade and then as I do my bevels I'll actually end up doing a full distal taper from the ricasso. Um, but this stage just helps before beveling just getting that material stretched out because that's going to give you your final tip profile as well. And as you notice, it's starting to stretch out even further as we go. And that means that we're going to have a nice long swept clip rather than a nice short one. As always, when doing uh, fullered drawings, um, like when you're drawing out using a peen or a fuller, you want to check that you're evenly forging. So you want to check the width of both the spine and the edge side, uh, because if you're forging one side more than the other, you can end up with a misshapen blade, which is very hard to straighten later. Um, in my case, I can normally see when I'm doing that because the blade will start to bend in one direction, much like when you're forging bevels. It will start to bow in one direction. Uh, like here, I noticed that I started to forge a little too much on the spine and it was curving towards the edge. And so I'm going to correct that in this next heat. And I'm actually going back to the flat hammer and dressing out a lot of these uh, fuller marks these pain marks to try and flatten everything out, see where my distal tape is at and if I need to increase it. And I'm also going to dress any widening of the blade, because remember this is the uh, the tip of the blade and we want a distal taper, but we also want a uh, cross-sectional, a, a profile taper. We want a taper that goes from the heel to the tip uh, in both directions. And if we had it too wide at this section, then it would be wider than the heel uh, and would look a little distended. If we were looking for a kukri, that would be a different problem. <laughs> I'm just dressing up that point, making sure that it's all flat. I don't want to dress it till it's concave. I don't want to create a sweep now because then it will be overly swept when we finally forge the bevels. Uh, I just want it to be dead straight now, so that when we sweep it up, it's got that nice, even curve.
And so now I'm going to just dress that distal taper back into the parent material to make it all even. Uh, because obviously there was a little bit of a sharp transition where I'd started the peening. Uh, and just now I've got to push that back into the main stock. Uh, so that it's all a nice even taper from about three quarters of the way uh, down the blade from the tip up to the tip. And I'm leaving the first section of the, the blade and the Ricasso area still at the parent bar uh, thickness. Again, just dressing the uh, overall profile taper, making sure I, if it's even at this stage, because it's distally tapered, if it's even thickness along the whole way, or even width along the whole way, you're going to end up with a profile taper. Um, but as I'm doing this, I'm obviously mushrooming out that spine and I need to dress that before I can move ahead with everything else because otherwise I'm ruining the distal taper that I've been putting into the blade. And I'm now just sharpening up that transition between the spine and the, where the clip starts. And so now I'm going to mark where I want to start my heel. Uh, I want this blade to be about 12 inches long, so I'm marking it at about 11 and a half inches. Um, I'm guessing that I'm probably going to end up with a 12 and a quarter, 12 and a half inch blade. I'm going to get about an inch of length from forging the bevels, but it's better to be a little bit too long than too short. I can always grind a little bit off the tip. And I'm going to start, like I always do, by forging in the plunge cut. I'm just matching the edge of my hammer with the edge of the anvil, creating a basically a fullering tool or a butcher tool that is creating an even pinch at that cross section. And I decided here to just angle the uh, the plunge cut a little bit. I actually preferred angled plunge cuts to straight up and down. Um, and I'm just going to keep pushing that down until I lose all heat. About there is good. Now it may look thin, but that's still about four millimeters thick at the edge. I'm going to roughly draw the bevels out down the blade to about four millimeters and then dress the banana bend in it from the beveling before I go back and then further refine the bevels down to about two millimeters thickness because this is going to be a fully ground blade. So I want it to be a little over thick because I want to be able to grind past any uh, hammer marks or any scale indentations and stuff like that to get to good clean metal. I've stressed in previous How to Forge videos that it's really important to forge from both sides of the blade. It is even more imperative with such a wide and such long a blade. When you get to wider and longer blades, as this one is, you are going to end up incurring much more twist and much more uh, deformation if you don't forge evenly than you will in smaller blades, and it's much harder to correct. So avoid forging just from one side if you can um sometimes you get caught up and <laughs> you forget but it's best practice to try and uh i i started off by trying to count my blows so you know six on one side then flipping and doing six on the other or you know vice versa whatever you want to do but basically if you can work out a way to be even uh that is the best method for going ahead with forging bevels A quick note on the uh, English Cutler's Hammer while we're here, given that this is a long video. Um, I've had a few people comment on the English Cutler's Hammer and its shape and how uh, strange it looks. Uh, I've given the history of the English Cutler's Hammer on my live streams before, but it's specifically designed in the uh, form that it is because it was actually a file cutter's hammer at one point. It was used for cutting the teeth in files, uh, hitting chisels, and they were actually angled much more towards the hand in that aspect. They were designed to be used by people who are seated in front of a file cutting anvil 
which was just above navel height. And so the head was angled quite sharply backwards towards the hand in order to be able to hit the back of the chisel, which was actually facing away from the user. When the uh, Sheffield Cutler industry started, uh, they found that their workers would tire out too quickly working on a standard blacksmith's anvil, sitting at, you know, a waist height, you know, the standard thigh height of a standard blacksmith's anvil, and then so instead started installing anvils at around navel height, or around belly button height. But then they found that the, uh, <clears throat> the smiths were then unable to forge accurately because they had to raise their elbow quite high. So instead they started using file cutters hammers and the added advantage of having a smaller face on a lot on, on such a heavy hammer meant that you had a lot of pressure in a lot of, in a much smaller space, uh, which means that weight pound for pound a Japanese style dog's head with a large face, uh, is going to do less work on the steel than an English cutlass hammer will. And that's why I prefer it. But I also prefer it because of the aesthetics. It just looks cool. So now we're just straightening out the banana. As I said, we didn't actually get all the way to the tip because I don't want to start pushing in that uh, curve until I've already got it relatively straight. And I'm just using my cutlass hammer and a wooden mallet to straighten it out. I don't want to... F uh, at this stage, the edge is only... F is still 4 mil thick. So I'm not worried too much about deforming the edge because I've still got to go back over it and forge it down to final thickness. But um, using that wooden mallet just means that I'm not going to put any big dings in the edge. Uh, I just don't have any, a wooden mallet that's heavy enough. I need to make one out of something like Jarrah. Uh, the, all the pine ones I've got are a little too light. <laughs> but once we've established that uh, nice straight spine or straight-ish spine, I'm going to dress the uh, profile taper a little bit because I noticed we were getting a bit wide. And then we're going to just start drawing those bevels back out again, moving up the tip. And now here at the tip, you're going to start seeing that curve come into the blade. Uh, and if you watch this week's Chalk Talks video where I talk about blade profiles, you'll know that uh, buoy profiles, clip point profiles, can differ quite a large way in uh, tip height. And each tip height has a specific intention behind it. Um, so you'll be able to know what this blade was designed for after watching that video. So make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell icon to be notified of when I upload new videos, because I'm doing lots of educational content surrounding bladesmithing, uh, blacksmithing, and metallurgy. So hope to see you around. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. But you could also hit that like button just to let the algorithm know that you liked it, and that'll help my channel out a lot as well. So here you can see that the tip is actually a little bit uh, down from the edge that I've already established, and that's because I've taken the tip down to around the uh, <clears throat> the two millimeter mark, the finished thickness mark, because I'm now going to go back and start moving moving the edge a little bit more down towards its final thickness. So at the moment it's a little bit of that Persian recurve, but uh, it's going to eventually be a an even profile taper. But before I do that. I'm going to establish my ricasso. I don't want to push it down too much because I prefer to grind my ricassos to shape. I don't like deforming the ricasso material too much because the flat bar is already quite flat and the flatter your ricasso is, the easier it's going to be to get a good uh, guard fit up. And if I have to grind anything off the ricasso, I'm grinding off the uh, thickness of the blade. So I try and remain, uh, try and leave it as untouched as I can but sometimes just adding a little bit more depth to the that ricasso really helps with uh, delineating the blade from the handle. And obviously a 50 mil high ricasso, if I wanted to have an even flow from the ricasso into the handle, that would require a 50 millimeter high or two inch high handle, which is just unusable by anyone. Like I have really large hands and it would not fit in my hand. 
But uh, yeah, normally normally you want a maximum Ricasso height of about 30 mil. Uh, in this case, I'm actually going to be doing more traditional handle mounting, which I may show on the channel later. As always, just dressing those mushrooms in from when I'm forging down. Obviously, it's a very large, wide bar, so you're not going to get full depth of penetration of the blow. So dressing out the mushroom is important. And now we're just going to offset where we want our tank shoulders. Actually, we're a little bit behind where we want our tank shoulders because the forging of the tank shoulders is almost never accurate. Um, and I almost always end up dinging the shoulder with my hammer accidentally as I'm drawing out the tang later. So drawing it down a little bit behind where I want it is crucial to make sure that I actually have space to uh, have a refined Ricasso. What I'm doing here is a little dangerous, forging with the uh, hardy tool still in place. I don't advise it. I was being very careful and I have a very long-handled hammer, so I was keeping well back from that uh, tool, but still, best uh, you know, most cases you want to remove the guillotine tool or any kind of hardy tool before forging on the rest of the face, especially when the guillotine tool is to your right hand if you're right handed or your left hand if you're left handed. Uh, but in this case, I, I took the risk. Don't take the risk. <laughs> but yeah, we're using uh, fullering dies in my guillotine tool to establish the shoulders of the tang and then. I am going to move to Preston the press uh, to draw out the tang. It was a very hot day. My camera was running out of batteries. I was running out of energy. <laughs> uh, and you guys have seen me draw out tangs by hand previously in this series. Uh, if you want to see that, then there are a number of videos in the How to Forge playlist where you can see me do this by hand. Uh, it's pretty easy to imagine how you do it by hand. You just forge it down using a cross pin or straight pin or the flat face of a hammer. Uh, this is just faster and uh, a little bit more efficient with the material. I did in two heats what it would normally take me about six to do. So <laughs> there are advantages to mechanical uh, methods of forging. So now that Preston's done his job, we can uh, forge in the, uh, <laughs> the marks that he's left behind, and we have a pretty much finished tang. I am going to spend a couple of heats after we cut it off the bar uh, refining it, but uh, this has made it a lot easier on me. But uh, while it's still attached to the bar, while we have the most control over it, because no set of tongs is going to be as secure as having it connected to the bar, um, we're going to use it to finally finish the blade and make sure it's all forged to final shape so that all we have to do once it's cut off the bar is just refine the tang, uh, straighten it, and it'll be done. So now I'm just pushing the bevels down a little bit further, making it to that two millimeter mark that I was aiming for. And I'm, I'd say two millimeters, but it's a rough calculation. It could be one and a half millimeters, it could be three millimeters, it really doesn't matter as long as it's consistent. I want consistent edge thickness and that's gonna guarantee that we have a consistent overall blade uh, width when it comes to the, the uh, final taper. I'm also using Kitai, which is a form of Japanese wet forging, uh, and this is going to help me keep the bevels nice and clean in the forging, 
Uh, I normally use this method if I'm doing a forged finished blade, which I originally intended for this one. Um, but given that it's my first buoy made out of W2, I'm going to be doing a hormone on this one. And so I want to have it all polished and finely ground. So yeah, originally the intention was to leave this as forged and maybe I'll do that in the future. But uh, wet forging is quite a, an easy way to get a nice clean finished forging. Uh, you could also brush between heats as well uh, using a nice block brush uh, before and after your uh, forging and keeping the anvil nice and clean. It's really important to keep that scale off the anvil because the scale is what causes the pitting. Uh, but yeah, water, for water forging or kitai is, is an incredibly useful technique to, uh, to learn and to understand. Of course, because it was a hot day and because I was forging hot metal on it for a long period of time, the anvil was quite warm and the water did dissipate quite quickly. It evaporated. But uh, even then, I still managed to get a quite a clean forging and you'll see that in the end. Now obviously as we uh, forge these bevels lower and get that width back, we are going to be inducing a little bit more of a curve um, as we are beveling the blade still. And so we're going to need to straighten that out. Uh, how much you straighten it is up to you. The original Muso buoy, which if you look up photos on the internet you'll be able to see, uh, was a little bit curved. It was obviously curved after the, the beveling process. I believe it was straightened at some point. Maybe the, this curve is quite close to the original curve, so it could be that they used a similar technique. I wouldn't be able to say uh, whether or not that's true, but uh, it is very slightly curved, much like this piece. Um, I prefer a little bit more of a straight spine on my musos, uh, and that's just purely my aesthetic. Uh, it's down to you what you decide is best in your design. At this stage, I'm not really forging, I'm just straightening. I'm just trying to push everything a little bit further left and right, trying to get everything in the center. So we're not really worried about forging too low uh, of a heat. Although, of course, this being a hyper eutectoid steel, being a very high carbon steel, uh, it will be a very, very uh, likely to crack if you forge it too cold. So be gentle if you can do that. And now, as I said, we're just going to dress that... that uh, curve out and refine the bevels, refine that plunge cut, get everything nice and neat before we cut it off the bar so that I don't have to do this holding it in tongs. Just a bit of whack forging here, a little bit of spinal tap to get it straight. And uh, you'll notice that I don't have the tip heated. If you heat the tip in this stage, if you're doing uh, whack forging, you will have the tip like end up flattening itself along the spine. You'll lose all of that curve to the, uh, to the clip. So yeah, don't do that if you're going to end up wanting a clip that's a little lower than the spine. And again, just dressing in that ricasso, making sure all the mushrooming is done, dress it, dressing in the uh, distal taper, and making sure that the bevels are nice and central. And this is an iterative process. You're going to have to check it, hit it, check it again, hit it again, check it again. It's a constant back and forth. Um, and with such a big blade, you're going to end up taking uh, a number of heats. Uh, I prefer low heats at this stage. Uh, you know, that low orange, uh, just to straighten everything out, because you're not really trying to move metal so much at this point, you're just trying to bend it. 
So right here, I'm actually using whack forging on a piece of wood, and now I'm going to transfer to the hammer just to push that tip down a little bit because I didn't want a tip that was quite up near the spine as it was in the uh, at the finish of the bevels. And so I'm just going to push it down a little. I try not to forge directly on the tip. Here I made a mistake and tried to forge a little bit too much on the tip. And that instead just pushes the tip down instead of pushing the whole clip down. But I pushed that back into place. It's a very subtle change in the overall profile, but to me it's a really important change because I want to, I have a very specific idea of what I want in my head. And like with any process, once you've forged it, you've got to make sure it's straight again. So now we're cutting it off the bar, a couple of wax on the hot cut, and then we can go to the bladesmithing tongs and pull it out ready for forging that tang down because the tang is still uh, quite over large uh, in both dimensions and it's too short. I want a tang that's about six inches to six and a half inches long and that's so that I can allow for guard, pommel cap uh, and candle as well the, of a, like a five and a half inch handle uh, if I want a large handle buoy which this is a very large blade and so a very small handle a large blade looks completely unbalanced and feels completely unbalanced so uh, a large handle is going to be important and a guard the guard stock can be anywhere up to you know half an inch thick so you're going to lose a little bit of of space on the handle in that and you can always clip off more than you can put back on <laughs> So I'm not sure if it's this heat or the next heat, but as I'm forging up near that shoulder, which is something you should try and avoid as much as you can, I do end up hitting the top of the shoulder, the tang shoulders, um, which isn't a big deal because again, I forged it behind where I want it, uh, so that I can then, you know, grind it forward or file it forward. But uh, yeah, it's still something that you want to try and avoid because it is a pain. And if you're doing a forge to finish blade, uh, it can be deadly for the build. And they say five minutes at the forge is 15 at the grinder, and uh, I definitely hold that to be true. So I will try and forge as close to shape as I can, uh, within reason. Uh, and that includes with my tangs. I like to try and forge in the taper from the Ricasso down to the tip of the tang. Uh, and I like to forge the, both tapers uh, nice and clean, so they don't have to do as much grinding, because uh, I really don't like grinding. Although grinding has improved in likability for me since I got my verse flow. Now I'm probably hitting it a little cold there, and uh, definitely should give up on, on hitting it, um, <laughs> because it is W2, uh, but I was getting impatient at this point. But just a nice final heat to just dress that taper out and make sure it's all flat, um, because nothing is worse than when it all cools down, you've got it in your hand, you notice that there's something wrong with it and you have to throw it back in the forge. Checking for straightness. Checking straightness on such a large piece is quite difficult. Um, it takes a little bit of, of tong handling and making sure that you're not stabbing yourself in the face with a red hot blade uh, to make sure that you've got everything dead straight. Uh, and I did end up doing just a little bit of cold, uh, cold forging to straighten it up, but that is the finished piece. And so here we have the overall view. I did take it to a wire wheel before this, but uh, you can see nice even edge thickness. We've got a nice distal taper. Nice tapered tang. You got our plunge cuts and the edge is centered. You'll have to take my word on that. I'm sorry, it's out of focus. 
<laughs> here I tried to focus the camera. The uh, plunge cut is a little chopped, um, but not too bad. Here I'd like to say thank you to my patrons. Uh, without them I wouldn't be able to do this, and uh, they are a fantastic support for me, and they make all of this kind of stuff possible. I would also like to uh, encourage you to check out my most recent video where I announced a Bowie competition, which is being held between the 1st of November 2021 and the 1st of January 2022, uh, where you can win engraving tools and all kinds of fun stuff, so go check that video out as well. Um, if you're interested in seeing more from me, as I said earlier, you can hit that subscribe button, hit notification bell icon to be notified of when, you, when I upload new videos, hit the like button, follow me on all my social media, and if you really want to support my channel, you can either donate to me through PayPal, which is linked in the description, or you can join my Patreon where you get access to behind the scenes videos, access to all of my videos 24 hours in advance. It's a great time. With that being said, have a fantastic day.